Summary Skin in the Game, Nassim Nicholas Talib. The core ideas in the book are, uncertainty and the unreliability of knowledge, the book discusses detecting nonsense and unrealistic theories without grounding in practice. The author argues that real-world experience is needed to understand the world. Symmetry and Fairness, the book argues that if you reap the rewards, you should also share the risks. If you harm others due to your actions, you should face penalties. The author claims that skin in the game is needed for justice and fairness. Information sharing in transactions, the book discusses how much information one should share with others in transactions and deals. For example, how much should a used car salesperson disclose to a customer? Rationality in complex systems, the book argues that real-world rationality is about practical statistical thinking linked to survival, not simplistic theories. Rational decisions must stand the test of time. The book explores surprising implications and unforeseen consequences of these ideas. Some of the questions addressed include, how do small and tolerant groups dominate society? Why do maximally universalist policies often backfire and hurt the people they aim to help? Why do we have more enslaved people now than ever before? Why shouldn't surgeons look like surgeons? Why did Christian theology emphasize Jesus's human side? How can cheap signaling fail in both business and religion? Why do flawed politicians seem authentic compared to credential bureaucrats? How can charities be inefficient if they are highly decentralized? How does scale affect communities, turning cooperative groups adversarial? Why isn't behavioral economics really about individual behaviors and markets? How is rationality linked to practical survival, not an abstract theory? The author argues that skin in the game is ultimately about justice, honor, and sacrifice, existential human concerns. He believes it can help address divergences between action talk, consequence intention, theory practice, expertise charlatanism, and more. The critical points in the summary are, the author refers to the story of Antinous to illustrate that actual knowledge comes from experience and contact with reality, contact with the ground, not just reasoning. Like Antinous, who lost his power when separated from the ground, knowledge loses its power when separated from reality. The author criticizes interventionists who advocate for regime changes without understanding the complexity of the situations or facing the consequences of their actions. He says they think in simplistic, one-dimensional terms and do not consider second and third order effects. The author says these interventionists never have to face the negative consequences of their misguided policies and therefore continue to advocate for them. In contrast, incompetent leaders in other domains, like pilots, get eliminated precisely because they have to face the consequences of their bad decisions and actions. In contrast, most of history was shaped by warriors and risk-takers who did face consequences, not risk-transferers. The author gives examples of Roman emperors who died or fought on the battlefield. The author says we now have the power to destroy the world in ways we never could before, so we must be careful with simplistic thinking and policies that could have unforeseen ripple effects. The key message is that experience, skin in the game, and facing the consequences is crucial for gaining fundamental knowledge and shaping wise policies. Reasoning alone is not enough. So, in summary, the author is arguing for humility, experience, and facing the consequences of hubristic reasoning by intellectuals promoting theoretical policies while avoiding responsibility for potential disasters. The anecdotes about Antaeus and Roman emperors illustrate these points through metaphors and historical examples. Here is a summary. Roman emperors and monarchs traditionally faced many physical risks to legitimize their rule. They derive authority from a social contract where they protect citizens in exchange for power and status. Today's centralized bureaucracies separate decision makers from the consequences of their actions. This needs to be fixed through decentralization, distribution responsibility, and accountability. Otherwise, the system will collapse under accumulating imbalances and black swan events. The 2008 financial crisis is an example. Bankers transferred risk to taxpayers while keeping profits. The crisis showed the need for skin in the game, ensuring risk takers bear the costs of their mistakes. Hedge funds do this better than big banks. Systems learn best through via negativa, eliminating weak elements. Individuals do not need to learn more from their mistakes, but evolution works through intergenerational filtering and selection. Skin in the game is critical to this. The concept of symmetry, ensuring risk and responsibility are balanced, is ancient and key to society. It started with Hammurabi's code which aimed to prevent tail risk transfers and hold people accountable. This principle has been central to law and ethics up to Kant. An example is Hammurabi's rule that if a builder's shoddy work causes a homeowner's death, the builder should be executed. This establishes symmetry and aligns incentives. The builder can't transfer the risk of extreme tail-end events. 
The author sees symmetry and skin in the game as defining ethics and sound governance. Bureaucracies and interventionists who lack skin in the game and accountability are the opposite. That's a high-level summary and analysis of the key concepts and arguments presented in the selected text. Please let me know if you want me to clarify or expand on any part of this summary. Here is a summary. The author argues that the best way for traders to hide risks in the financial world is to bury them in unlikely scenarios that only they can uncover. By the time problems surface, the traders are long gone. For example, the author cites an English banker who frequently changed jobs and wives to avoid accountability. The author says the notion of an eye for an eye from Hammurabi's code is metaphorical, not literal. It means inflicting some penalty, not necessarily removing an actual eye. The legal system can impose penalties through the court system to protect people, even if it annoys them. The author argues that we are better off with a legal system than without one. The author expresses surprise that the code of Hammurabi is housed in the Louvre Museum in Paris. However, most visitors, including French financiers, must know its significance or connection to accountability. The author sees this as ironic, given the proximity to where he was lecturing on skin in the game. The author argues the silver rule. Do not treat others as you would not like to be treated, is more robust than the golden rule of treating others as you want to be treated. The silver rule tells you not to impose what you think is good on others and focuses on avoiding harm. It works at multiple scales, from individuals to societies to countries. The author criticizes universalism, which takes ideas that work on paper but not in practice. People are local and practical, sensitive to scale. Micro works better than a macro. Focusing on one's immediate environment and using simple, Practical rules is best. Universal rules tend to attract self-righteous psychopaths. The author introduces Fat Tony as a character representing the opposite of a typical analyst or academic. Fat Tony became wealthy by helping suckers lose money. Fat Tony's notion of symmetry is do not give a crap, do not take crap. However, if someone tries to exercise power over you, exercise power over them. The author says this notion of symmetry links to virtue and virtue ethics. However, Taking ideas too far, like Kant's categorical imperative, leads to disaster. It is best to stay practical and local. Here is a summary, symmetry in transactions and alignment of interests is crucial for stability. Lack of symmetry, where liabilities are transferred silently, leads to instability and blow-ups. Regulations often hide rather than fix risks. The agency problem arises from the misalignment of interests between parties in a transaction. People have more information about themselves than others and can hide risks. Filters like deductibles help address this. There are fools of randomness and crooks of randomness. Fools take risks they do not understand. Crooks transfer risks to others. Reality filters out fools and crooks. We should focus on revealed preferences, what people do, rather than their explanations or forecasts. What we do reveals more than what we say. Forecasting and speculation are very different. Outcomes in life are complex not binary. Skin in the game helps solve problems of uncertainty, black swans, and the inverse problem. It reveals what is robust and leads to the intelligence of time. Rationality is what allows collectives and long-lived entities to survive. Going against nature and statistical significance is irrational. Skin in the game is necessary overall but should be applied proportionally. Harmless opinions are different from interventions causing real-world harm. Historically, the asymmetry of professionals without skin in the game causing harm without accountability is rare. In short, symmetry, alignment of interests, reality-based revealed preferences, and skin in the game lead to stability and robustness. Their absence leads to instability, black swans, and eventual collapse. However, skin in the game should be proportional to the real-world impacts at stake. Here is a summary, the author argues against modernism and intellectualism that separates theory from practice. Those who propose solutions should have skinned in the game, facing the consequences of their proposals. Specialization leads to the separation of labor from its results. People who give lectures are uncomfortable on stage because of bright lights, but lighting experts do not give lectures. Train designers made coffee ledges unusable. Architects build to impress other architects, not for residents. Simplicity comes from skin in the game. Without skin in the game, people propose complex solutions. Academics make papers complicated to get published. The author says he is dumb without skin in the game. With skin in the game, boring things become attractive, like carefully reading financial statements if you have investments. Even addicts show mental skills getting drugs that disappear in rehab. The author's knowledge of risk and math came from having skin in the game as a trader. With risk, a second brain emerged from analyzing probabilities. However, without real stakes, 
that skill disappeared. Solving practical problems is different from academic theorizing. What is learned from the intensity with skin in the game stays after the intensity fades. Kids would like math more with skin in the game and learn to spot misuse of math. There are two ways to protect from predators, regulations and legal systems. Regulations lead to predation by the state and loopholes for the well-connected. Legal systems make rules predictable and hard to gain. They decentralize power and allow competition. In summary, the critical argument is that skin in the game, facing the consequences of one's actions and proposals, leads to better, more straightforward solutions. In contrast, the absence of skin in the game leads to complex, unusable solutions designed to impress rather than work. Skin in the game is a vital way of gaining knowledge and skill. The author illustrates his arguments with many examples from his experience and public life. Here is a summary of the key ideas. Regulations often benefit special interests and end up hurting society. Once in place, they are hard to remove. They accumulate and choke enterprise and life. A better solution is to rely on civil liability and lawsuits. This adaptive approach balances interests and holds people accountable if they cause harm. The common law legal tradition is built on this approach. Some regulations may still be needed when civil liability is insufficient or systemic risks exist. However, freedom should generally be preferred, along with responsibility for one's actions. Honor and skin in the game are central to ethics. Having no skin in the game is dishonorable. Honor means there are some actions you would never do and some you would do unconditionally. Artisans and entrepreneurs are examples of people with skin in the game. They do things for existential reasons, put their soul into their work, have sacred taboos, and would not compromise quality for gain. In contrast, many supposed entrepreneurs today are scheming to cash out without care for what they build. Having an assistant, except when truly needed, removes your soul from the game and distances you from authentic and meaningful activities. Having as much unstructured free time as possible is better than doing only what you enjoy. That covers the essence of the key ideas around regulations, skin in the game, honor, artisans, entrepreneurs, and the value of unstructured free time. Overall, a meaningful and ethical life requires having skin in the game, responsibility for one's choices, and a willingness to sacrifice for purpose and community. Bureaucracy, meaningless activity, and solely focusing on financial gain should be avoided. Here is a summary. Corporations are not responsible for long-term consequences like individuals are because corporations can dissolve and reorganize. Individuals have skin in the game like corporations do not. Products and companies that bear the owner's name, like eponymous companies, show commitment and confidence. Even perceived arrogance or ego can benefit these products and companies. Some wealthy individuals obtain citizenship in countries they have no solid connection with just for the benefits like travel. However, citizenship should require natural skin in the game like commitment, obligation, and responsibility. The author only considered Greek or Cypriot citizenship because of his ancestral connection. He became a U.S. citizen out of commitment, even though it meant paying higher taxes. To understand concepts like courage and stoicism, read original texts from people like Seneca, Caesar, and Aurelius or commentators who were also doers, not just academics. Academics often lack real-world experience and skin in the game. Heroes of history were people of action, not just students of ancient texts. Some protectionism and decentralization make sense because people find meaning in their work, not just the economic value. Workers want to do things, have a craft, and contribute, they want soul in the game. Outsourcing jobs may increase profits but deprive people of purpose. An anecdote about the judgment of Cambyses illustrates that judges used to have natural skin in the game. A corrupt judge was flayed alive and his son dispensed justice from his father's flayed skin as a reminder of the costs of bad judgments. In summary, the key concepts are skin in the game, responsibility, obligation, downside, soul in the game, purpose, meaning, craft, and arrogance slash ego, confidence and commitment. These concepts argue for individual responsibility, protectionism, decentralization, and original thinkers over pure academics. Here is a summary. The author finds book reviews and some book reviewers frustrating because they often need to catch a work's essential point or soul, especially those by risk takers. For the Incerto series of books, each new book emerges from ideas in the previous one. The author reluctantly had to read many dull books on tort law but found the topic could have been more compelling and compelling. However, the author's recent and unplanned deep dive into mathematics made him even more sensitive to nonsense from intellectuals and academics. Many book reviewers have a fundamental conflict of interest with readers. They wrongly think they should determine how books are written and organized. However, 
Books should be organized as readers want to read them. Reviewers have unchecked power over authors and can fabricate or misrepresent with impunity. However, the author now has direct ways to interact with readers to bypass reviewers. The book has five parts. The introduction discusses the Incerto series, the author's frustrations with book reviews, recent mathematical interests, and book organization. A first look at agency discusses symmetry and risk sharing, conflicts of interest, ethics, scaling, and limitations of globalism. That greatest asymmetry examines minority rule where small group imposes its preferences on the majority. The appendix shows how a collection of units behaves differently from the sum of its parts and problems with some social science. Wolves Among Dogs explores dependence and a type of slavery in modern life where employees have more to lose than contractors. Even independent people with financial security can be targeted through people they care about. Being alive means taking certain risks discusses how risk-taking is necessary for progress and why harming others for profit is unethical. The precautionary principle can lead to paralysis and lack of innovation. An entrepreneur's function is to bear uncertainty and make progress. According to the author, the summary outlines the main ideas, sections, and flow of the book's argument. Please let me know if you want to clarify or expand my summary. Here is a summary, the book presents the fundamental idea of skin in the game that people exposed to the consequences of their actions behave differently from those who are merely observers or commentators. The summary explains various examples of hidden asymmetries, situations where some parties have skin in the game and others do not. Some examples, experts who sell advice but do not have skin in the game. The example of the lecture agent who claimed his services were good for you but did not share in the harm. Generally, beware of unsolicited advice where the advisor benefits but would be safe from bad advice. Traders sell unwanted securities by manipulating and pressuring buyers who lack knowledge and experience. An example is the investment bank, where traders pay salespeople to push unwanted inventory on to naive clients through lavish dinners and psychological pressure. As one said, a new customer is born every day. How do religions that are legal philosophies differ from those where believers have actual skin in the game? Atheism is functionally similar to Christianity but differs from Salafism. How history is distorted by historians and experts in international relations who focus on wars and violence rather than periods of peace and cooperation. If we removed peace experts, the world might be safer and more stable. The logic of risk and how it forms a more rigorous basis for rationality than theoretical reason alone. Absolute judgment requires not just thinking but action, consequences, and exposure to harm. Risks can be individual or collective and courage plus prudence are required for the latter. The precautionary principle can be misused as an argument against technological progress rather than managing real risks. In all these domains, the author argues that we must identify and remove asymmetries, demand skin in the game, and avoid being manipulated or misled by those wishing to benefit from us without sharing in the potential costs and harms. We must focus on consequences and exposure to be rational, ethical, and prudent. Here is a summary. The critical question discussed is whether it is ethical for a seller to withhold information from a buyer that would affect the buyer's decision to purchase an item, specifically if the seller knows the item's price will likely drop. Two ancient Stoic philosophers, Diogenes of Babylon and Antipater of Tarsus, disagreed. Diogenes argued that a seller need only disclose as required by law. Antipater argued for full transparency beyond legal requirements. The author sides with Antipater, arguing that ethics are more robust than laws which vary across time and place. Islamic law, Sharia, and Jewish law, Talmud, also weigh in on this issue and generally favor more transparency and fairness in transactions. Sharia law prohibits gerar, which refers to uncertainty, deception, and unequal uncertainty between parties in a transaction. A story is told of the scholar Rav Safra, who felt obligated to sell an item at the original price even after a buyer offered a higher price, showing the transparency of intentions. The author argues that while full transparency and fairness are ideals, they do not always scale up and work for all groups. As Nietzsche argued, we may relax or lift ethical rules when dealing with outsider groups we do not identify with. A country, city, and family all operate differently. There are scale transformations that prevent us from generally applying standards across all groups. The key conclusion is that full transparency and fairness in transactions are ethically superior but often unrealistic given human nature and the varying scales of social groups. We tend to apply different ethical standards to our groups versus more distant outsider groups. Here is a summary. Ancient Athenians and other free citizens belonged to exclusive clubs that only applied democratic principles to citizens, not enslaved people or foreigners. 
Theodosius deprived Roman citizens who married non-Romans of legal rights, effectively excluding them from the club. Jewish law also distinguishes between thick and thin kinship, with unequal treatment. Most pre-Christian societies had many exclusive fraternities and clubs. Even today, groups like the Roma people, Gypsies, and Goldman Sachs have strict rules for insiders and outsiders. As groups scale up, universal ethical rules break down. We can theoretically be both ethical and universalist but not in practice. Political systems should start locally and build up, not the reverse. Trying to force very different groups into a single system often fails. Separating or marking group boundaries can promote cooperation. People cooperate more efficiently at a smaller, more familiar scale. We follow ethical rules for people we know, not abstract others. Personal relationships, not general principles, govern interactions. Eleanor Ostrom found that below a specific size, groups protect common resources as if the group itself were rational. However, commons must be a manageable size. People share some things within a group but not with outsiders. Groups have rules for interacting with strangers. Public good and individual interest are abstract ideas. In reality, people often identify with and work for the good of groups like families, communities, and tribes, not just themselves or all of humanity. The tragedy of the commons only applies when groups are too large. Smaller groups can effectively manage shared resources. However, commons must be limited to a particular scale. Risk sharing means groups take on risks together and share the costs, unlike risk transfer. In ancient sea trade and caravans, all participants shared costs for losses, not just owners of lost goods. This promoted cooperation. Commentators often talk their book promote a position because it benefits them, not because it is correct. They are incentivized to be overconfident since they bear no cost if wrong. Those with skin in the game are incentivized to consider the opposite view. Here is a summary of the key points. Complex systems behave in unpredictable ways due to interactions between components, not the nature of the components themselves. Studying the components individually will not help in understanding the system. We need to study the system as a whole. The minority rule refers to the fact that a small minority of people with a strong interest in an issue can sway the entire group to follow their preferences. Even when the minority is small, like 3-4% to of the population, it can dominate the group's choices and preferences. This happens through an optical illusion where observers will think the majority's preferences match the entire group's. However, in reality, the minority dominates the group. The minority rule shows how asymmetric choices in a complex system can have huge effects. Some examples, smoking sections, due to the minority of smokers, most non-smokers have to sit in smoking sections in restaurants. The preferences of a small minority end up affecting the entire group. Food choices, the availability of certain foods is determined by a small minority of people with specialized diets, gluten-free, organic, etc. The majority end up with fewer food options to choose from. Overwork, a minority of hard workers in a company can pressure the majority into working too hard to keep up the work preferences of a few end up affecting the whole company. Conversion, a minority of highly religious people within a group can sway others to convert to their religion. The beliefs of a few can spread to many. Market collapse, during market crashes and panics, a minority of sellers end up crashing the entire market, even though most investors want to hold on to their stocks. The actions of a few panicked sellers affect all participants. In summary, the minority rule shows how asymmetry in complex systems, where a few essential parts can sway the whole, leads to counterintuitive outcomes. We need to look at their components to understand these systems. We must study them as a whole to grasp their emergent properties. Here is a summary. A small minority of intransigent people with strong preferences can shape choices for the whole population through an asymmetry in choices. The minority will not accept what the majority accepts, but the majority will accept what the minority accepts. This is illustrated through several examples, kosher foods, a small minority of Jews who eat only kosher foods lead to most food and drinks becoming kosher so that producers and sellers do not have to distinguish between kosher and non-kosher items. Peanut allergies, a small minority of people with peanut allergies means most foods avoid peanuts, so they are peanut free. Criminals, honest people will not commit crimes, but criminals will engage in legal acts. The effect depends on the following. The spatial distribution of the groups, if the minority is concentrated in one area, their preferences may not spread as much. However, their preferences are more likely to dominate if they are evenly distributed. The cost difference, if the minority preference is much more expensive, it is less likely to spread widely. However, if the cost difference is slight, the minority rule is more likely to take over. Examples of minority rule in effect include, 
most meat in the UK and South Africa is halal, even though Muslims comprise only 3-4% to of the population. The spread of organic and GMO-free foods is due to a minority of people who prefer such foods, even though the evidence suggests GMOs are safe. The majority will eat GMO-free food, even if they would also eat GMOs. The summary is that a small group of virtuous, determined people, the minority, can shape choices for the whole of society through this asymmetric effect. However, companies and industries often miss this point and think they need to win over the majority. Here is a summary, the spread of a choice or behavior in a population may be due to a minority of people who strongly prefer that choice, not necessarily a majority preference. This is known as the veto effect. The renormalization group is a method of analysis that shows how the choices of a minority can spread through interactions across groups and scale up to impact larger populations. An example is how a single non-GMO family can influence a neighborhood to provide more non-GMO food options over time. Politically extreme parties are also subject to the veto effect. Their base supporters are inflexible, but they can also attract some flexible voters and gain more influence than their small numbers might suggest. Models show this can lead to counterintuitive election outcomes. The veto effect explains the popularity of options like McDonald's or pizza that are not anyone's first choice but are acceptable to most and offensive to few. They are universal donors. Languages, unlike genes, are subject to minority rule. A lingua franca can emerge based on the language spoken by a powerful minority, as with the spread of Aramaic by the Persians or English in business settings. The choices of bilingual speakers also show minority rule in action. Genes are subject to majority rule and change slowly over time, while the languages can spread quickly due to minority rule. Racial theories that link language, culture, and genetics are misguided, as populations often remain genetically continuous while undergoing shifts in language or culture. Mediterranean and Northern European populations provide examples of this. In summary, the spread of choices, behaviors, and traits in populations must often be better understood. Both majority preferences and the strong influences of vocal or influential minorities play a role. Languages and cultures are especially prone to spread through minority rule, unlike genetic traits. Recognizing these dynamics leads to a more nuanced understanding of how populations change over time. Here is a summary. Genetically, ancient Greeks and Bronze Age Levantines were closely related. Their languages diverged over time. Two asymmetries can explain the spread of Islam in Christian areas, if a non-Muslim man marries a Muslim woman, he must convert to Islam. Any children must be raised Muslim. Converting to Islam is irreversible, since apostasy is punishable by death. These asymmetries allowed Islam to spread through interfaith marriages and irreversible conversions, even with a small Muslim population. Christian cops in Egypt were significantly impacted. Early Christianity also spread through the aggressive and intolerant proselytizing of Christians, not Roman persecution. Christians were intolerant of Roman paganism, not vice versa. Decentralization is advantageous because it prevents a stubborn minority from controlling a group. If there are many small groups, the minority may control some but not all. A single large group is more prone to minority control. Moral values and bans on books slash ideas are often imposed by an intolerant minority, not due to consensus. Most people are passive and indifferent. It only takes a few zealous activists to impose their values or demand censorship. There is an asymmetry between following and breaking the rules, halal, haram. Once a moral rule is established, a small intransigent minority can impose it on society. While some see society becoming more moral over time, it may be a minority. Though some blame all Poles for not helping Jews in World War II, most did help. However, it took many Poles to help one Jew while only one poll was needed to betray them. So the effect of a malevolent minority can outweigh that of a benevolent majority. In summary, the key points are, asymmetric rules allow small and tolerant groups to spread their values. Decentralization prevents minority control. Zealous minorities, not consensus, often impose moral values. Malevolent minorities can outweigh benevolent majorities. Here is a summary, societies and systems are often more stable and ethical under minority rather than majority rule. Minority rule leads to less variance and more binary outcomes. Examples of minority rule include, an evil person poisoning soda cans. It is more effective to use cyanide, minority rule, since it only takes a little bit to poison the whole drink. A majority poison would require poisoning most of the liquid to be lethal. Strictly religious rules like keeping kosher. Even a little bit of non-kosher food contaminates the whole meal. Intolerant minorities like Salafists can undermine democracies and tolerant societies. Democracies have an inconsistency in that they tolerate intolerance. 
markets are disproportionately influenced by the most motivated participants, not the average. Even small orders can move markets if the participants are stubborn. Science also progresses through falsification by a motivated minority, not consensus. Military forces with an active and courageous minority can defeat larger forces. A lion leading sheep is better than sheep leading lions. A small minority often drives revolutions and social progress. In summary, society evolves and changes through the asymmetric rule of a motivated minority, not the average or majority. There are asymmetries and minority influences in many areas of life. The following section will discuss how slavery is more widespread than commonly thought. Here is a summary. The Gnostics were a secretive early Christian sect, so much of their teachings and records are lost. Secretive groups tend to hide and bury their information. The Carthaginians lacked variety in personal names, with many people having the same names, like Hamalkar and Hasdrubal. This makes them hard to track historically. The character Gisco in Flaubert's Salambo is one example of a frequently used name. Minorities of just 3% can affect major changes, like changing Merry Christmas to Happy Holidays. However, as their numbers grow, diverse societies often incorporate multiple viewpoints, as in the author's experience growing up in half-Christian Lebanon. The average behavior of individuals does not represent the group's behavior, especially with non-linear relationships. Psychological studies of individuals show biases but do not necessarily apply to groups. Human nature depends on interactions with others, not isolated individuals. Groups differ qualitatively based on the number, like a book versus a building. Higher dimensionality leads to disproportionately greater complexity. Understanding neurons will never equal understanding the brain. Genetics does not equal understanding an organism's behavior. The mean field approach applies average interactions to groups, but only works without asymmetries. This approach fails for evolutionary theory and the selfish gene narrative. Much supposed progress in behavioral science may be nonsense. Unintended segregation can emerge from individuals' actions. The proper market structure allows idiots to function well together. Zero intelligence agents following the proper rules can match intelligent agent sufficiency. Some seemingly irrational individual actions may benefit the group. Individuals need not understand the system to participate. Early monks called gyrovagues were celibate wandering monks without institutional affiliation. They lived by begging but had freedom. The organized church banned them by the 5th century. Total freedom threatens organization. Benedict's rules provided stability, changed behavior, and obedience for monks. Organizations wanted to deprive members of some freedoms and give them skin in the game with significant loss potential for disobedience. Here's a summary, the passage discusses the pros and cons of employees versus contractors. Employees provide more stability and reliability but are more expensive. Contractors are cheaper but more prone to act opportunistically. Employees have skin in the game, they have a lot to lose by not acting dependably unlike contractors who mostly fear legal punishment. Employees signal submission and obedience by giving up their freedom and personal schedules to work for a company. Companies use to expect employees to work for them for life. These company men base their whole identity around the company. However, as companies became less stable, the idea of lifetime employment faded. Employees are now companies' persons, they feel they must be employable by any company, not just their current one. They are scared to upset potential future employers. According to Ronald Coase's theory of the firm, employees exist because the transaction costs of constantly negotiating contracts are too high. It is more efficient for companies to hire employees. Employees are more valuable to the company than on the open market. The passage argues that Coase's theory would have been improved by incorporating the idea of skin in the game, that employees also provide value through risk management and stability. So in summary, the key ideas are, employees provide stability and risk management, skin in the game submission to employers, and are an efficient solution to high transaction costs, according to Coase's theory of the firm. However, the modern company's person is more concerned with employability across companies, not just loyalty to one firm like the old company man. Here is a summary, in today's complex world with specialized subcontractors, certain employees are more necessary than ever to ensure smooth operations. Errors and delays are very costly. Corporations have historically employed a curious form of slave ownership by overpaying certain expatriate employees, expats, and making them terrified of losing their status and perks. This ensures their loyalty and support for the company, even from far away. The story of the dog and the wolf illustrates this dilemma. The dog has comfort and security but ultimately depends entirely on its owner and risks being abandoned or euthanized. 
the wolf is self-sufficient but lacks security, one must decide whether to be a dog claiming to be a wolf or of real skin in the game. Most employees are like dogs, but some wolves among the dogs, like successful traders and salespeople, cannot be easily controlled because the company depends on them. They can get away with disruptive behavior due to their value. However, they also live with the constant risk of losing their jobs if they become unprofitable. Risk takers value freedom but understand it comes with downsides, as in the story of the wild ass whom a lion eats. Freedom is never free. Signs of the wolf include not caring about corporate reputation, foul language and risky behavior, unprofessional dress, and arrogance. These signal that one is accessible and competent. However, cursing can also be a sign of ignorance and low status. The highest status is indicated by adopting the behavior of the lowest class. What matters is not what a person has or does not have, it is what he or she is afraid of losing. The more you have to lose, the more fragile you are. Even reputable people can be concerned about losing face in public debates. In summary, the passage explores the dilemma of security versus freedom using the metaphors of dogs, wolves, and wild asses. It analyzes how some maverick employees who value freedom and have skin in the game can be valuable yet disruptive to companies that depend on them. It argues that what one stands to lose, not just what one has, determines how fragile and risk-averse one becomes. Here's a summary, being in a high-ranking position does not necessarily make you powerful or free. You can be vulnerable to losing your job and reputation, as exemplified by David Petraeus. Bureaucrats and elected officials must please voters and committees, so they are only partially autonomous. In contrast, autocrats like Vladimir Putin who do not depend on public opinion or elections are freer to act as they choose. This makes them appealing to some. Historically, monarchs had more autonomy and sometimes cared more for their kingdom. Modern dictators, however, often pillage their countries to enrich themselves. Employees and bureaucrats cannot be relied upon to make complex critical decisions or deal with emergencies effectively. They aim to please their supervisors and advance their careers, not necessarily do what is best. This can lead to inaction, misguided policies, and ignoring serious problems. Examples include the U.S. policies of invading Iraq after 9-11 instead of confronting Saudi Arabia, and bailing out banks in 2009 instead of prosecuting misdeeds. Whistleblowers face difficult decisions in exposing harm or wrongdoing. They risk losing their jobs, reputations, and ability to provide for their families. Even if eventually vindicated, it can take a long time. However, they also feel complicit in the crimes if they say nothing. It is a conflict between responsibility to society and to one's own family. Many end up staying silent to avoid these consequences. In summary, only those with autonomy and skin in the game can be trusted to make hard decisions and confront problems. Bureaucrats and employees are limited by their need to please higher-ups and advance their careers. Whistleblowers are rare because they take on significant risks with uncertain reward. Overall, real change depends on people with true independence and conviction. Here is a summary. The passage argues that it is difficult for individuals to act ethically when their families and close ones can be negatively impacted by their actions. Corporations and powerful actors often exploit this vulnerability by threatening or harming families and friends to coerce individuals into unethical behavior or compliance. To overcome this vulnerability and act ethically without compromise, the passage suggests two solutions, celibacy or lack of close relationships. Individuals can act freely without fear of retribution against their loved ones by not having a family or close relationships to worry about. However, celibacy is an extreme solution that limits the spread of one's message or cause. Financial independence, if individuals have FU money, they have the means to act independently without fear of losing their livelihood or ability to support their families. However, true financial independence is rare, and people can often still be threatened. The passage gives several examples of how unethical actors have targeted families and friends to compel individuals, including, corporations preferring employees with families who are easier to control The samurai were required to leave their families as hostages The Ottomans used janissaries, enslaved Christians with no families, as soldiers Ralph Nader faced harassment from his mother during his activism against GM. The author faced harassment from colleagues to compel him into a campaign against genetically modified organisms A university faced harassment for honoring the author, showing how institutions can be more vulnerable than individuals. The central argument is that ethical behavior often comes at the cost of those around you, as unethical actors will exploit any vulnerability to coerce compliance. However, individuals can work to overcome this challenge by limiting vulnerabilities through a lack of commitment to people or things. Overall, the passage highlights how intertwined individual and collective welfare can be. Here's a summary, 
The passage discusses that in ancient times, individuals were not viewed as standalone units but as part of a more prominent family or collective. As an example, it cites an ancient law stating that if an architect's building collapsed and killed the master's firstborn son, the architect's firstborn son would be put to death. It also discusses how gypsies had rules allowing the family of a murder victim to receive a relative of the killer. The passage argues that to deter terrorists willing to kill themselves, we must convince them that blowing themselves up is not the worst possible outcome by punishing their loved ones. However, the author expresses discomfort with punishing individuals for the crimes of another. Instead, the author supports preventing terrorists' families from benefiting from terrorist acts. The passage then discusses how the magician David Blaine displayed skin in the game by pushing an ice pick through his hand during a magic trick, showing his willingness to take real risks. The author argues that Jesus displayed skin in the game by suffering and sacrificing himself. The passage criticizes Pascal's wager by arguing that fundamental belief requires skin in the game. It also criticizes philosophers' experience machine thought experiments, arguing that only facing real risk and harm can provide an authentic life experience. Finally, the passage argues that Donald Trump won the Republican primary because he seemed genuine to voters despite his visible flaws and deficiencies, unlike other candidates. The author believes the public prefers a natural person with skin in the game, even if flawed, over a slick but unreal persona. Here is a summary, the author criticizes a group of people he calls the intellectual yet idiot, or e. These are semi-educated people, typically with degrees from prestigious universities, who occupy policy-making and media roles but have no real-world experience. The author argues these e's, tell others how to live and think but have no skin in the game themselves. They face no consequences for being wrong mistake scientism, the appearance of being scientific, for actual science. They need to understand probability, statistics, or the complex behaviors that emerge from simple rules. Pathologize and criticize others for acting in their self-interest while claiming to know people's best interests. They mainly criticize ordinary people as uneducated or populist. Are prolific in media like the New Yorker but rarely interact with ordinary people outside their bubble. They likely attended TED Talks but never drank with a minority cab driver have been wrong on many issues, from dietary fat to the Soviet Union to Middle East policy, but failed to learn from their mistakes. They substitute first-order logic for the second and higher-order effects that determine outcomes in complex systems. Use jargon and theory detached from reality. They are too theoretical for a given problem. Are highly concerned with reputation and saying the right words, rather than achieving real-world results. The actual test, the author argues is whether they can do complex physical tasks like deadlifting that require concrete skills rather than just intellect. In summary, the author argues that we are ruled by an intelligentsia class lacking wisdom, practical skills, and skin. This is the insidious disease of modernity. The remedy is to return governance to people with more practical wisdom and real stakes experience. Here is a summary, there are two types of inequality, tolerable inequality from differences in ability, effort, and heroism and intolerable inequality from rent-seeking and undue privileges. People resent the latter type. There is a difference between static inequality, a snapshot in time, and dynamic inequality, accounting for mobility and changes over a lifetime. Dynamic inequality is more equal because people at the top rotate and face the possibility of descending the ladder. Static inequality fosters resentment because people at the top seem permanently entrenched. Ergodicity means that people have an equal chance of occupying different rungs on the socio-economic ladder over time. Perfect ergodicity would mean everyone spends time in all rungs. Non-ergodic or absorbing systems trap people in particular rungs. Ergodicity promotes dynamic equality. The author criticizes Thomas Piketty's focus on static inequality. Piketty and Pikettyists are part of the Mandarin class academics and intellectuals who promote specific normative ideas without understanding people and society. They miss how people view inequality and economic mobility. Piketty's view is inequality versus inequality. He focuses on the inequality of outcome rather than the inequality of opportunity. But unequal outcomes are tolerable if people face risks and the possibility of downward mobility. Skin in the game, facing risks and consequences, makes inequality tolerable and prevents systems from deteriorating. In summary, the author argues for a dynamic, ergodic view of inequality based on risk taking and mobility, rather than a static, Piketty-esque framing of inequality as unequal outcomes. The former is consistent with people's thinking, whereas the latter fuels misguided resentment. Here is a summary, the author discusses the reaction of Mandarin's intellectuals and academics, to Thomas Piketty's book on inequality, Capital in the 21st Century. 
The author argues that Piketty's theory about rising inequality was flawed, as he did not correctly account for changes in the individuals at the top of the income distribution over time. The author published papers pointing out these mathematical flaws in Piketty's work. However, the author was dismayed by the reaction of mandarins to his critique. Rather than engaging with the substance of the critique, they dismissed it and continued to lavish praise on Piketty's work. The author argues this because mandarins benefit from arguments for reducing inequality, as it solidifies their social status and privileges. In contrast, regular people are less concerned with inequality and more concerned with their material well-being. The author argues that envy and concern over inequality is primarily stoked by intellectuals in the clerical class, not the poor or disadvantaged. Their concern is driven more by a desire to take down the wealthy than to help the poor. The author says Aristotle and other philosophers have noted that envy is often directed at those closest to us in status. The truly poor are less concerned with far-off wealthy people they do not interact with. The author argues that intellectuals' concern with inequality stems from their tendency to think hierarchically and competitively. They project this view onto society as a whole. In the past, the wealthy were more socially integrated with people of lower classes. Today, the wealthy self-segregate and lose empathy for the poor, who become an abstraction. The author is critical of intellectuals advocating for low-income people without meaningful interaction with them. Finally, the author argues that more than data is needed for a rigorous argument. Piketty's book was praised more for surface markers of rigor like charts and graphs than for making a mathematically sound argument. The author implies that intellectuals and academics can be taken in by the appearance and trappings of rigor rather than its substance. Here is a summary, the author avoided including too much data or graphs in the black swan to make a point. He believes people often use excessive data and statistics to compensate for weak logical reasoning or arguments. They need to correct lots of data for valid empiricism. In reality, one only needs a small quantity of significant data, especially this confirmatory data, to prove a point. For example, you only need to show someone has $50 million in their account to prove they have over $10 million, not provide an inventory of all their minor assets. The author finds thick books full of graphs and tables to prove a point suspicious. They usually indicate a failure to distill information properly. While the general public finds such presentations of data convincing, they can be used to substitute truth for complexity. The author provides an example in Steven Pinker's book The Better Angels of Our Nature. Pinker claimed a decline in violence using lots of data, but further scrutiny revealed issues with his data and logic. The numbers did not back him arguments The numbers did not back his arguments. The author argues that it is unethical for public servants to greatly enrich themselves upon leaving public office. They should pledge to limit how much they can earn in the private sector. Otherwise, there is an implicit bribe where they favor specific industries hoping to get high-paying jobs later. The dynamics and sequence of events matter. Private sector success provides evidence of competence, but public servants need more. There are vicious circularities in who determines expertise. Time and results ultimately show who the real experts are. The Lindy effect argues that the longer something persists, the more likely it will persist into the future. However, one should be wary of anyone proclaiming themselves an expert. That covers the key highlights and arguments around data use, public service compensation, determination of expertise, and the Lindy effect from the selected passage. Let me know if you want me to explain or expand on any summary part. Here is a summary, the Lindy effect states that the longer something has survived, the more likely it will survive. Things that are fragile or not adaptable do not survive for long. The author argues that the Lindy effect shows that time is the ultimate judge of ideas, people, technologies, etc. Things that stand the test of time prove their robustness and longevity. Short-term hype or popularity is not indicative of long-term success or accuracy. The author discusses two ways things can handle the passage of time, aging slash perishing or becoming more robust. Non-perishable things like ideas and books do not intrinsically age and can become more robust over time. The idea of the Lindy effect itself is Lindy proof, as seen in adages promoting tried and true laws, food, books, etc. The author argues that we do not need experts to judge experts, as time will ultimately show what lasts. The author argues that peer assessment and the judgments of contemporary individuals are not good indicators of longevity or accuracy. Free and independent thinkers are not primarily dependent on peer approval. Time is the ultimate judge, not current readers, reviewers, or institutions. The author is critical of the bureaucracy of institutions that rely on proxies like prestige or publication and peer-reviewed journals to determine importance or accuracy. These metrics do not necessarily align with what stands the test of time. 
academic fields that lack skin in the game can become self-referential. The author argues that knowledge should not be an athletic contest and that competition destroys knowledge. Some academic fields map less to actual research over time. In summary, the key ideas are that time is the ultimate arbiter of accuracy and longevity, not peer assessment, popularity, or institutional prestige. The Lindy effect shows that the longer something lasts, the more likely it is to continue lasting. Fragile or flash in the pan ideas, people, technologies will not stand a test of time. Things that are robust and anti fragile become more so over time. We should be suspect of metrics that do not have skin in the game or do not rely primarily on the judgment of time. Here is a summary. The opacity and inaccessibility of academic disciplines like economics to outsiders allow those inside to control the flow of ideas and information. More than simply knowing economic theories does not mean genuinely understanding economics in the sense of how economies work. Academic courses and curricula can quickly become dominated by fashionable ideas with little practical use. However, there are signs that the current system will change, such as alumni cutting funding for useless or ridiculous disciplines and programs. At some point, such programs must provide career opportunities and compete with more practical professional training. Studying specific fashionable theories may no longer lead to jobs. The most convincing ideas are those that go against one's self-interest or status, that require sacrifice. Academic work should be deprostituted by requiring researchers to have real-world jobs and do research in their spare time so they have skin in the game. This would filter out useless ideas and research. Science works best when ideas are Lindy-prone, meaning they have survived a long time. This is a better mechanism than falsification alone. For ideas to survive, they must help those who hold them survive. An idea that lasts long without being proven wrong will last even longer. Science should focus more on usefulness and reducing harm rather than proving ideas true. Empirical academic research that relies on data and controlled experiments is less valuable than clinical experience in the real world. Ideas that have survived generations have been tested in a risky, real-world environment. Advice from grandmothers and elders is more likely to work than most research from psychologists and social scientists. Much of the latter does not replicate or generalize outside of experiments. The wisdom of the ancients has survived because both the ideas and the populations that held them survived. All social science and psychology must have antecedents in the classics to be valid. Examples of grandmotherly wisdom with support from both ancient lore and modern psychology include, cognitive dissonance, the fox sees the grapes he cannot reach as sour. Loss aversion, losses are felt more deeply than gains. Negative advice, it is easier to identify what is wrong than right. The absence of evil may be better than the presence of good. Skin in the game, one cannot reap benefits without costs or risks. One's efforts and investments yield the best results. Anti-fragility, what does not kill us makes us stronger, from Nietzsche but with roots in ancient literature like Seneca. Adversity can strengthen individuals and systems. Here is a summary, incentives can lead to unintended consequences if not correctly aligned. See Machiavelli and Rousseau's works on how incentive structures impact political systems. Time preference. People tend to prefer immediate rewards over future benefits, even if the future benefits are more significant. This is captured by saying, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. The madness of crowds, groups of people can engage in harmful behaviors that individuals alone would not. As Nietzsche said, insanity in individuals is something rare, but in groups, parties, nations and epochs, it is the rule. Less is more, excessive complexity or quantity can be counterproductive. As the proverb goes, Truth is lost with too much altercation. The phrase less is more conveys the same idea. Overconfidence, excessive self-assurance in one's judgments can lead to poor decision-making and unintended harm. Erasmus noted, I lost money because of my excessive confidence. Paradox of progress, progress is sometimes linear or unidirectional. As society progresses materially, new challenges emerge. More choices and advancement can also lead to new difficulties. Thinkers like Montaigne have noted this paradox. Appearances can be deceiving. Skills and competence only sometimes correlate with how people look or present themselves. As the proverb goes, handsome is that handsome does. Judging based on appearances alone can lead to poor decisions and missed opportunities. The example of the two surgeons, the refined, Ivy League one versus the uncouth butcher, illustrates this idea. The butcher may be the superior surgeon. Having had to overcome more obstacles, the millionaire next door is an example of this concept. Real success and competence only sometimes look the part. Flashy signals of wealth or status do not necessarily correlate with the actual accumulation of wealth or ability. 
private bankers learn not to be deceived by appearances. In summary, these concepts suggest that we should be skeptical of appearances, think critically about incentives and potential unintended consequences, beware of overconfidence in our judgment, and recognize the paradoxes inherent in progress. Judging based on substance rather than superficial attributes will lead to better decisions and outcomes. Here is a summary, the key ideas in the passage are, intellectuals and academics tend to favor complexity over simplicity. They are focused on how things appear rather than how things work. Fundamental knowledge and skill is revealed over time through practice and experience rather than through articulate explanations or confident presentations. Successful businesses and sciences grow organically by people with skin in the game, not through elaborate planning or funding. Business plans and funding proposals are mainly helpful for selling ideas to investors rather than building a business. Real businesses emerge from practice, not from theoretical plans. There is a tendency to overintellectualize and overcomplicate human behavior and decision making. People rely more on simple heuristics, rules of thumb, and intuition. An intellectual attempt to describe all the complex calculations involved in a task like catching a baseball must be revised. Players rely on simple rules of thumb and must understand the underlying math or science. Institutions and interventions designed to solve problems often create more problems because the people involved need more skin in the game. They are rewarded for proposing complex solutions, not simple and effective ones. The solutions they propose to fix problems often need solutions themselves to fix the unanticipated consequences. Simple, practical solutions proposed by people with skin in the game are often superior to complex solutions by academics and intellectuals without skin in the game. However, these practical solutions need to appear more intellectual and scientific, so they are often ignored in favor of more complicated approaches. What appears intellectual or scientific is only sometimes what works best in practice. Many of society's problems stem from previous misguided interventions by intellectuals and policymakers who need more skin in the game. Their complex solutions often create more problems than they solve. The key message is that skin in the game, practical experience, and simple heuristics are more valuable than intellectual complexity in solving problems in business, science, or society. What appears superficially scientific or rational is sometimes the most effective approach. Here's a summary. Complicated solutions are often proposed by people whose job and training incentivize them to do so, even if more straightforward solutions would work better. These people do not face the consequences of the adverse side effects of the complex solutions. Just because something uses advanced technology does not mean it is more scientific or efficient. For example, short plane trips are not necessarily more efficient than driving even though planes are more technologically sophisticated. We are too easily impressed by the cosmetic attributes of scientific solutions. The story of genetically modified golden rice is an example. The real issue was inefficient distribution of regular rice and vitamins, but technologists proposed a complex, profitable genetic solution. They used manipulative tactics to promote it and smear critics, even though the solution likely increased systemic risks. More straightforward solutions should have been addressed like distributing rice and vitamins separately. Once people and solutions are judged by metrics and evaluations rather than actual results, distortions occur. For example, evaluating traders based on the percentage of profitable days encourages risky short-term behavior, even if it leads to significant losses in the long run. Elite universities have become a status symbol and drag on the middle class. Like an MBA, degrees that depend heavily on the school's prestige could be more meaningful. In contrast, Degrees like mathematics depend more on actual skills, regardless of school ranking. Simple solutions and tools are often the most effective, even if they do not appear sophisticated or scientific. For example, barbells provide a simple but effective workout, unlike fancy gym equipment. Moreover, real progress comes from pushing past your limits rather than from a straightforward, polished experience. When people become wealthy, their interests can diverge from their well being. For example, the wealthy may value flashy, luxurious things over practical solutions. The next chapter will explore this idea further. Here is a summary, the author argues that people lose control of their preferences as society gets wealthier. They get manipulated by those trying to sell them things into choosing complicated and unnecessary options that make them unhappy. The preferences of the wealthy are often dictated by those trying to profit from them. For example, the author went to a fancy Michelin-starred restaurant where the food was complicated but unsatisfying and would have preferred casual, tasty pizza instead. However, his wealthy dinner companion insisted on the fancy restaurant. The author says poison is drunk from golden cups, the wealthy are easy targets for scams and manipulation. 
As society progresses, satisfaction follows an inverted U-curve, where more wealth initially brings more happiness but then causes degradation and negative utility. If a pizza costs $200, even the snobby Michelin crowd will line up for it, showing their preferences are constructed, not natural. The author argues that hiding your wealth and education to have real friends is best. True friendship and community require quality. Progress should aim to reduce poverty, not just increase wealth. The author illustrates these points with the example of the Assassins, a secret society that would threaten but spare the lives of their enemies, to control them. Having a living enemy under your power was better than a dead one. A key lesson is to put skin in the game of your enemies by letting them know the game's rules and that they owe their life to you. In summary, the key arguments are, as society progresses, people lose control of their preferences and get manipulated into choosing unnecessarily complicated and unsatisfying options. The wealthy are particularly prone to having their preferences constructed by those trying to profit from them. Real friendship and community require a relative equality in hiding excessive wealth or education. Progress should aim to reduce poverty, not just increase wealth, due to the inverted U-curve of satisfaction. It is best to have power over your living enemies by putting skin in the game and controlling them, rather than killing them. Here is a summary, the expression made him an offer he could not refuse refers to a threat, usually of violence. The author discusses two categories of terrorist groups, those that indiscriminately kill civilians to spread fear and advance their agenda. Groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS fall into this category. Those who target strategic political assassination see themselves as resistance or freedom fighters. Groups like the IRA and Algerian independence groups fall into this category. The assassins were an 11th to 14th century Shiite sect that mastered the art of political messaging and manipulation through targeted threats and occasional assassination. They preferred to control their enemies rather than kill them. Their threatening messages were meant to convince leaders like Sultan Sanyar that they controlled his fate without issuing direct verbal threats. The author argues that political assassination in small doses can be helpful to democracies by increasing turnover at the top. In today's world, leaders have more power and longer tenures, partly due to increased lifespans. More frequent leadership changes were expected in places like ancient Rome. The author sees assassination as absolutism tempered by assassination. The author discusses using cameras and photography to control unethical individuals today, like assassination. Simply photographing someone threateningly and making them aware you have captured their image can be enough to change their behavior due to the uncertainty over how the images might be used. The author gives a few examples of using this technique to deal with rude and aggressive people in public. In summary, the key ideas are political messaging through targeted threats and violence, different categories of terrorist groups, the historical role of assassination and turnover of political leaders, and using photography as a modern tool for control and manipulation. Here is a summary. The author recounts an experience where journalists grossly misrepresented a public discussion he had with David Cameron by taking a 20 seconds tangential comment out of context and making that the focus of their reporting. This illustrated the systemic agency problem with journalism, where the interests of journalists diverge from the public they serve. Information wants to spread naturally through word of mouth and two-way communication, not through centralized filters that can be controlled, like newspapers and TV historically. People got their information by talking to each other in places like markets, pubs, and coffee shops. Rumors and news spread through social interactions and were filtered through crowdsourced vetting. Today, social media has returned information spreading to this more natural two-way format. However, in the mid-20th century, one-way media like newspapers and TV allowed information to be more easily controlled by those at the top. The author argues that journalists today worry much more about the opinions of other journalists than the actual public they serve. This contributes to monoculture and metoism in the profession. Economic insecurity also makes journalists prone to manipulation by lobbyists and interest groups. In debates and intellectual discussions, it is unethical to criticize someone by taking their words out of context or misrepresenting their actual position. Charlatans and journalists will focus on extracting specific statements to make someone sound absurd, rather than engaging with their real arguments or point of view. The author says no one can write something that could not be taken out of context and sensationalized in this way. He provides examples of thinkers like Karl Popper and F.A. Hayek who were careful to accurately represent their opponents' positions before critiquing them. In summary, the key points are, information spreads best through organic, two-way communication, not one-way filters. There is an agency problem with journalism in which journalists' interests diverge from the public. It is unethical to criticize someone's ideas by misrepresenting or taking them out of context. 
This behavior contributes to monoculture and metoism as people are afraid to express unpopular ideas. Economic insecurity amplifies these problems by making people prone to manipulation and groupthink. Examples of good practice include accurately representing someone's position before critiquing it. Here is a summary. The passage discusses virtue signaling and the difference between virtue and the appearance of virtue. The author recounts an encounter with the writer Susan Sontag, who claimed to be against the market system but lived an extremely lavish lifestyle. The author argues that claiming virtue without fully experiencing the consequences of your ideas is immoral. If your private life conflicts with your public ideas, it invalidates your ideas, not your private life. The author distinguishes between the public and private spheres. Some theoretical people can ignore reality in favor of the theory. If you believe you are helping people experiencing poverty through conferences and meetings, you can ignore actual poor people. The passage gives examples of wealthy socialists and environmentalists who mistreat others privately. Your private actions must be able to generalize for your ideas to be valid. The author criticizes virtue signaling, especially for profit. Hotels advertise environmentalism to save money, not because they care about the environment. Causes like poverty, the environment, and justice are now used to signal virtue and make money. Real virtue is not advertised, it is done secretly, as Jesus teaches in Matthew 6 1-4. The critical question is whether you want to be virtuous or seem virtuous to others. As Charlie Munger said, would you rather be the world's most excellent lover and seem like the worst, or vice versa? True virtue is about being, not seeming. The Latin phrase si quam videre means to be, rather than to seem. In summary, the key ideas are, Virtue signaling and hypocrisy are immoral. It would help if you practiced what you preach. Public ideas and private actions must align. Private actions invalidate hypocritical public ideas. Real virtue is done in secret, not advertised for profit or status. It is better actually to be virtuous than appear virtuous to others. Does this summary accurately reflect the key ideas and arguments in the passage? Let me know if you want me to clarify or expand on any summary part. Here is a summary. The author argues that true virtue is unpopular and requires taking real risks in action, not just signaling virtue or engaging in empty charity. Historically, simony and indulgence has allowed people to buy their way into heaven without virtuous action. Today, some charitable giving and do-goodism act similarly by allowing people to signal virtue and gain social status without real sacrifice or risk. True virtue, the author argues, helps those neglected and voiceless, not just those favored by the crowd. It requires courage and taking uncomfortable positions, not just spouting popular opinions. The highest virtue is unpopular because it can damage one's reputation and status. For young people looking to save the world, the author recommends avoiding virtue signaling and rent-seeking. Instead, they should start a business, take risks, and gain real-world experience. Courage and risk-taking, not abstract principles, are the highest virtues. The author speculates that many geopolitical problems, like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, would resolve themselves without meddling interventionists. People on the ground usually want practical things like economic opportunity and will work things out to achieve that if given a chance. However, grandstanding leaders and misguided do-gooders disrupt that process by imposing principles and geopolitical concerns from a distance, without dealing with the consequences. The road to peace is through trade and cooperation at a human level not top-down treaties and posturing. In summary, the key points are, virtue requires risk and sacrifice, not just signaling. True virtue helps the neglected and voiceless, not just the popular. The highest virtue is unpopular because it can damage one's status. Courage and risk-taking are the highest virtues. Many geopolitical problems would self-resolve if not for meddling outsiders imposing abstract principles. Peace arises from human cooperation, not top-down posturing. Here is a summary, the author went on a safari in South Africa hoping to see lions but only saw one lion during the entire trip. Most of the animals he saw were peaceful herbivores that got along. This illustrates that nature is primarily collaborative, not competitive as the law of the jungle metaphor suggests. Historians and scholars in international relations often focus on wars and conflicts, giving the impression that history is mostly violence and instability. However, in reality, history is mostly peace punctuated by wars not the other way around. These scholars need help understanding vital mathematical concepts like the difference between frequency and intensity. They also overfit historical data and focus too much on exciting events rather than the absence of events. Accounts of past wars are often exaggerated and inflated over time. Historians miss silent facts and the absence of data points. 
they should consider what is missing from the historical record, not just what is present. Reading history books without perspective is like reading an account of life in New York based only on what happens in a hospital emergency room. Historians and policy experts operate under structural biases because they derive their knowledge from books, not real-world experience. They are not empiricists. The author gives examples of Arabs, Turks, and Byzantines collaborating and trading with each other despite geopolitical conflicts. During civil wars, life often continues as usual for most ordinary people. Historians need to pay attention to these more mundane realities. The key takeaway is that absence of skin in the game leads to distorted information and perspectives. Real people on the ground are more pragmatic and interested in cooperation, unlike institutions and intellectuals. We must consider what needs to be added to commonly accepted narratives and accounts of history and current affairs. The truth is often more nuanced than dramatic events-based stories. Here is a summary, the author argues that the meaning of the word religion varies significantly across groups and periods. For early Jews and Muslims, religion was synonymous with law. For Romans, religion referred to social rituals and festivals. For early Christians, religion concerns spiritual matters separate from law and politics. The meaning of religion has evolved in modern times. For Jews, religion has become more ethno-cultural. For Christians, religion focuses more on aesthetics and ritual. For Buddhists and Hindus, religion involves spiritual philosophy and ethics. The varied meanings of religion can lead to confusion and conflict. Politicians and bureaucrats often fail to recognize that certain belief systems, like Salafism, are essentially political ideologies, not just religions. They need to understand that beliefs differ in how they are held. More literal beliefs leave less room for adaptation. The author argues that paganism and libertarianism are similarly diverse and decentralized. They do not fit within strict organizational structures like political parties or churches. Julian the Apostate failed to realize this when he tried to organize paganism like the Christian church. Libertarianism is a political movement, not a political party. It can only have a unified policy on some issues. In summary, the key points are, the meaning of religion differs based on time, place, and group. Beliefs also differ in how they are held. More literal beliefs are less adaptable. Paganism, libertarianism, and other decentralized belief systems do not fit within strict organizational structures. They cannot be unified under a single policy or hierarchy. Failing to understand these differences leads to confusion, conflict, and poor decision-making. Politicians and bureaucrats often misclassify belief systems and groups. Here is a summary, libertarianism is a broad movement with fractious factions but share some core beliefs like rule of law over rule of authority. Libertarians value complex systems and self-organization. Belief requires commitment and sacrifice, not just words. Religions demand tangible proof of belief, not just evidence. Theology requires Christ's sacrifice to make him human. Early Christians recycled pagan altars and practices. Christians and Jews were not very distinguishable from pagans at first. The altar in a Syrian church has a blood drain, showing early ritual sacrifice. Sacrifice was key to worship in the pre-Christian Greco-Semitic world. God's demanded revealed preferences, not just words. Burnt offerings were burnt so humans did not eat them. Even Jewish and early Christian worship involved blood sacrifice. Christianity and Judaism eventually made sacrifice metaphorical. However, Catholic and Orthodox services still have a simulacrum of sacrifice in the Eucharist, representing Christ's sacrifice. Judaism ended animal sacrifice after the Second Temple's destruction. The story of Abraham and Isaac shows the move from human sacrifice to animal sacrifice to metaphorical sacrifice in Abrahamic faiths. However, animal sacrifice continued for a well out of habit and tradition. A place of worship's focal point, like an altar, represents the sacrifice and commitment of believers. Belief without sacrifice is a new concept. The Pope receives excellent medical care, showing the Church values practical action over soul prayer or miraculous intervention. Religion is more than talk, it is about managing rituals and actions. So, in summary, the key ideas are, belief requires real commitment and sacrifice. Early Abrahamic faiths valued actual ritual sacrifice before transitioning to metaphorical sacrifice. Religion is defined through action and ritual, not just words or ideas. These themes are illustrated by anecdotes about the Pope's medical care and the Syrian church altar. Here is a summary. Most Christians and religious people are atheists in actions but religious in words. Their actions and decisions are indistinguishable from atheists in most spheres of life. They only differ in rituals, sacrifices and beliefs which often do not directly affect survival. Rationality and survival are closely linked.
What matters most is not what you believe but what you do. Rational beliefs and actions are those that aid survival. Some false beliefs and perceptual distortions can even aid survival by leading to valuable actions. Survival comes before truth and science. We have survived without science for a long time but need to survive to do science. It is rational to be selectively paranoid about risks to survival even if it means harboring some irrational beliefs. The key idea is ergodicity, the ability to survive all events without irreversible damage. There should be no significant irreversible harm for the world to be ergodic. Survival of humanity and the system are more important than individual survival. There is a trade-off between bias and variance. It may be better to have some systematic biases that get you closer to survival than unbiased random errors that can lead to ruin. It is best to maintain a margin of safety from disaster when fragile. Three thinkers who have shaped the ideas of rationality are Herbert Simon, Gert Gigerentza, and Ken Binmar. They focused on how people make decisions and solve problems in the real world under constraints. Rationality emerges from this ecological, evolutionary perspective rather than an abstract logical one. The key takeaway is that rationality is not about logical precision or true beliefs alone but more fundamentally about beneficial, survival-enhancing actions. Some falsehoods, deceptions and distortions may be features, not bugs, in the system. Moreover, survival trumps all other metrics of rationality. Here is a summary, Herbert Simon proposed the idea of bounded rationality, humans have cognitive limitations and cannot make perfectly rational decisions. We rely on heuristics and shortcuts. Our knowledge is incomplete, and it is not easy to understand the world thoroughly. Ken Binmore argued that the concept of rationality needs to be defined. He proposed the idea of revealed preferences, you cannot know someone's true beliefs or reasons for acting just by asking them. You have to observe how they act and what they choose to spend resources on. Beliefs are cheap talk, what matters is how people act. Religion evolved as a way to enforce intergenerational risk management. Religious rules are easy to teach and follow. We should not dismiss beliefs and superstitions that help populations survive. Science does not currently provide a complete understanding of the world. There is a difference between decorative beliefs and beliefs that map to actions. How much you truly believe something can only be seen through the risks you take for that belief. Many beliefs may serve as background furniture for the human mind. The most rigorous definition of rationality is that which aids survival. Anything that hinders survival at any level is irrational. The precautionary principle and understanding of risk are essential. Although decorative beliefs may seem superfluous, they often have a function we must fully understand. We should consider how populations with certain beliefs have survived, not just how long the beliefs have lasted or how they compete. Religious dietary laws, for example, promoted group cohesion and survival despite seeming irrational to outsiders. In summary, rationality should be defined in evolutionary and survival terms, not based on logical reasoning alone. Even if they seem illogical, religious and cognitive beliefs may have essential functions for group cohesion and survival that we do not fully appreciate. Revealed preferences, how people act and what they choose to sacrifice for, matter more than their stated beliefs. And we must consider the survival of populations, not just the competition between beliefs themselves. Here is a summary, rationality is about risk management and survival, not explanatory factors. Things survive for a reason, not everything happens for a reason. There is a difference between ensemble probability, across a group, and time probability, for an individual over time. What applies to a group does not apply to an individual because individuals hit ruin points, like going bust, that groups do not. Most research on probability and decision making fails to account for this difference and the effect of ruin. They wrongly assume individuals can get the same outcomes as the group, only a few geniuses, and people with skin in the game, have understood this. Situations with the possibility of ruin, like absorbing barriers you cannot return from, are non ergodic. In these situations, past probabilities do not apply to the future and cost benefit analysis breaks down. An example is playing Russian roulette, while five sixths people may win, if you keep playing you end up dead. Repeated exposure to risk also undermines typical statistical thinking and cost benefit analysis. Even if there is a slight chance of something going wrong, with many repetitions eventually something will go wrong. For example, any individual flight may be very safe but no pilot would survive doing many flights if that is all they considered. In real life, accumulating many small risks can significantly reduce your life expectancy, even if any individual risk seems minor. The effect of ruin and repetition mean you can't consider risks in isolation. The key points are that ruin matters, repetition matters, and you have to consider the compounding effects of risk over time, 
not single static probabilities. Rationality is about surviving a long game, not isolated gambles. Here is a summary. Repetition of small independent risks leads to certain ruin over time. As medicine improves life expectancy, we must be more vigilant about accumulated risks. Studies that measure risk aversion often ignore the many other risks people face in life and the fact that they will continue facing risks going forward. Loss aversion is challenging to measure correctly. How people make decisions reflects all the risks they face, not just the one in the study. Mental accounting, where people think of gains and losses in separate mental accounts, is considered an error by some behavioral economists. However, people who use mental accounting, like only increasing bets when they are ahead, employ an information theory strategy to maximize long-term gains. This strategy should be encouraged. Risk aversion does not exist. We observe strategies people employ to avoid ruin, which is what matters. We should worry more about collective ruin than individual ruin. Individual death is not the worst possible outcome for most people. The death of loved ones and humanity as a whole is worse. We should think in terms of layers, with individual at the bottom and humanity slash environment at the top. Risks to higher layers are more worrying. Courage is sacrificing lower layers to protect higher ones, not selfish risk-taking. Prudence also involves protecting higher layers. Courage and prudence are not opposites. True rationality is about decisions that ensure long-term survival, even if those decisions don't match stated beliefs. If superstitions aid survival, they can be rational. Rationality is about filtering out risks, not conducting cost-benefit analyses of every option. Not all risks are equal. Multiplicative, systemic, fat-tailed risks are much more worrying than individual risks without these qualities. Comparing them as if they were equal is naive empiricism. We should fear pandemics and other extremist and events, not just individual tragedies. Anti-fragility involves loving risk that provides upside, not ruin. Volatility is not the same as risk. Small stresses can be beneficial, large ones harmful. We should fear some risks but not others. Evidence-based fear-mongering can mislead if it ignores these nuances. Here is a summary, the key ideas in the passages are, we live in a world of extreme events and unpredictability, extremist and not a world where the average or the mean prevail, mediocrity. Extreme events are subjected to different rules and probabilities. They cannot be subjected to the current off-bound, a statistical rule that applies for mild, ordinary events. Journalists and social scientists are prone to make mistakes in reasoning about extreme events because they rely on tools for analyzing ordinary, mild events, mediocrity. They fail to understand that extreme events can arise from multiplicative processes and feedback loops. Probabilists who study extreme value theory, like Paul Embrex, better understand extreme events, extremist and, because they focus on tail events, not ordinary events. Things become more apparent when analyzing the tails of probability distributions. One should avoid systemic ruin. One can be risk-seeking but avoid ruin. The benefits never offset the risks in a strategy that can lead to ruin. As one ages, one relies less on reasoning and theorizing and more on conclusions and intuition. With experience comes wisdom. A long list of examples of incomplete or meaningless things without other necessary components. For example, no muscles without strength, no friendship without trust, no opinion without consequence, no age without values, no life without effort, and so on. She expressed thanks and gratitude to various people who contributed to the writing and ideas in the book. I am calling out Ralph Nader and Ron Paul as two courageous men. That covers the main summary points from the passages. Please let me know if you would like me to explain anything in the summary in more detail. Here is a summary, Bob Rubin trade, a situation with visible benefits and rewards for the agent but the downside risks and costs are diffuse and distributed among others. The agent has no penalty or skin in the game for adverse outcomes. This can apply to politics, finance, etc. Interventionista, someone who causes fragility by thinking they understand a complex situation when they do not. They are not subjected to feedback and consequences and lack humility and a sense of humor. Green lumber fallacy, mistaking the source of essential knowledge or attributing the wrong importance to specific knowledge. How do theorists get it wrong in assessing what knowledge is essential in a field or business? Lecturing birds how to fly effect, inverting the direction of knowledge flow makes it seem like institutional or academic knowledge precedes real-world practice and experience. For example, you are acting as though technology owes more to science than it does. Lindy effect, non-perishable things like books, technologies, corporations, etc., have a longer life expectancy the longer they have survived. So a 100-year-old technology is likely to last another 100 years. Ergodicity, 
when a system's ensemble properties match its time properties, the aggregate behavior of components matches the behavior of a single component over time, allows risks and probabilities to be transferred between ensemble and time domains. Mediocristan, a domain where extremes and outliers are rare, like income for most professions. A single observation is unlikely to impact the aggregate significantly. Thin-tailed distributions like the Gaussian characterize them. Extremistan, a domain where extremes and outliers are common and impactful, like income for entrepreneurs or book sales for authors. Fat-tailed distributions characterize them. A single observation can majorly impact the aggregate. Minority rule, when a small minority determines the aggregate behavior of a system. For example, Non-smokers determining the rules around smoking since they cannot tolerate smoke but smokers can tolerate non-smoking areas. Languages, ethics, and religions often spread via minority rule. Via negativa, an indirect definition that focuses on what something is not rather than what it is. They are seen as less prone to error than a direct definition, via positiva. It means avoiding or subtracting things rather than adding them since the effects are often non-linear and unpredictable. In medicine, Stopping smoking is less harmful than adding treatments. Scalability, the properties of a system often change abruptly when its scale increases or decreases. Cities differ from counties, islands differ from continents. Collective behavior changes with group size, arguing for localism over unfettered globalism. Intellectual monoculture, journalists, academics, and others without skin in the game in a field converge on a politically correct and pensant mode of thought that resists empirical evidence. Descent is punished creating an echo chamber, like decreasing ecological diversity with increased island size. Virtue merchandising, debasing virtue by using it as a marketing strategy rather than living it privately. True virtue requires courage, sacrifice, and skin in the game. It is not virtue if it lacks these or is used to sell a brand. Analogous to the historical sin of simony, buying and selling ecclesiastical offices and indulgences. Principle of charity. Representing an opponent's argument as accurately and persuasively as you would represent your own. The opposite of attacking a straw man. Achieves intellectual symmetry and good faith debate. Here is a summary. State space estimations often incorrectly assume agents are rational and can accurately estimate probabilities and make optimal choices. Due to cognitive biases and limitations, agents often need to be more accurate in their estimations and choices. This flawed assumption is a case of confusing a random variable, which is static with the payoff of a time-dependent, path-dependent, dynamic, process. A simplified example, consider a sequence of independent random variables in the positive real numbers. According to the law of large numbers, the average will converge to the mean. However, in reality each variable depends on the previous one, path dependence, and there is a chance of ruin, dropping to zero. In this case, the temporal average will be lower than the state space average. This is a failure of ergodicity. The state space expectation does not equal the temporal expectation. The probabilities change based on the path taken. To fix this, we can use a transformation like the natural logarithm to make the two expectations belong to the same probabilistic class, becoming ergodic. Logarithmic transformations are often used in risk analysis and maximizing opportunity. The precautionary principle suggests avoiding ruin altogether instead of relying on transformations. This logic extends to more complex processes like Brownian motion. The key is that risks should be evaluated based on their potential effect over the entire lifespan, not as one-off events. The longer the lifespan and the fatter the tails, more potential for extreme events, the bigger the ruin problem. The principle of probabilistic sustainability says agents should evaluate risks as if they were to experience them repeatedly over their lifespan. This helps address the confusion between state space and temporal expectations. Logarithmic transformations are necessary to evaluate risks under this principle properly. They allow risks with infinite support, like, zero, to have finite moments, enabling the use of extreme value theory. Here is a summary, positive random variables can be transformed from bounded support, a maximum value h corresponding to ruin, to unbounded support, from zero to infinity, while preserving their statistical properties. Kramer and Lundberg developed this concept in their analysis of insurance risk. Ergodicity is not statistically observable or testable. It refers to an ensemble probability measure, not what can be inferred from observing a single time series. Ergodic strategies, like the Kelly criterion, are designed to capture the expected return of an asset, alpha, without hitting an absorbing barrier that leads to ruin. Fat-tailed distributions are those where tail events dominate outcomes. The boundary between thin-tailed, mediocristan, and fat-tailed, extremistan, 
distributions occurs at the sub-exponential class. Sub-exponential distributions do not have exponential moments, and extreme events probability declines more slowly than an exponential distribution. The notes cover philosophical ethics, moral hazard, decision-making under uncertainty in Islam, the meaning of an eye for an eye, rationality, inequality, the Kelly criterion, satisficing, violence, renormalization, thick blood, and bounded rationality. References on genetic studies of populations, the Lindy effect, and other topics are also included. Key concepts include anti-fragility, scalability, skin in the game, rent-seeking, wealth generation, and dispossession. A tax scheme that reduces the upside potential to increase equality is criticized as disadvantaging entrepreneurs in favor of rent-seeking careers. The optimal strategy, in that case, becomes to avoid risk-taking and wealth generation. References on selfish genes, group selection, inequality, ancient Greece, and the Phoenicians are included. Languages can change faster than the underlying genetics of populations. The summary outlines the key topics, concepts, examples, and references in the notes without going into depth on any particular area. Please let me know if you would like me to explain or expand on any part of this summary further. Here is a summary of the sources in the range you specified, 15 to 29. Amianus Marcellinus history accounts for the Roman Empire in the 4th century CE, covering events from 353 to 378. Nassim Nicholas Talib and Pasquale Cirillo analyze the statistical properties of violent conflicts. They find that conflicts follow power law distributions and are prone to extreme outliers. Yanir Baryam and Hiroki Sayama propose a mathematical model of evolution from a gene-centered perspective. Model evolution is an information process using statistical mechanics and nonlinear dynamics concepts. Ken Binmore's Rational Decisions presents a rational choice theory and moral reasoning from a decision-theoretic perspective. Binmore argues that rational agents should follow principles of expected utility maximization. James Binney et al. introduced the renormalization group theory of phase transitions and critical phenomena in statistical mechanics. Simon Blackburn's Ethics, a very short introduction overviews major theories of ethics, including utilitarianism, deontology, and virtue ethics. George Moore's generalization of the core principles of utilitarianism. V. Chistyakov studies sums of independent positive random variables and their applications to branching processes in probability theory. Pasquale Cirillo and Nassim Nicholas Taleb argue that data on violent conflicts suggest conflicts follow power law distributions and are dominated by outliers. Harold Kramer studies mathematical models of risk in the economics of insurance. G. Downey provides accounts of the reigns of Julian and Justinian and their policies toward Christianity. Ito Eliazar discusses Lindy's Law, which states that the future life expectancy of a non-perishable technology or culture increases proportionally to its current age. Paul Emberich et al. Develop mathematical models of extreme event risk in finance and insurance. Embrex, Goldie, and Veraverbeek study the class of sub-exponential probability distributions. Andrea Fontanari et al. Proposes a method for estimating the Gini coefficient, a measure of inequality, for data with infinite variance. Robin Lane Fox provides an account of paganism and Christianity in the Roman Empire from the 2nd to 4th centuries CE. Serge Gallum proposes socio-physical models of social dynamics, opinion formation, and political phenomena. Donald Giman et al. proposes a method for constraining tail risk and optimization problems using maximum entropy methods. Garrett Gigerentz argues that moral satisficing, a boundedly rational heuristic strategy, can explain moral behavior that seems inconsistent with consequentialism or deontology. Gigerenza and Brighton argue that heuristics using evolved cognitive abilities can lead to good inferences and decision-making. Grossman and Hart model issues of moral hazard and incomplete contracts in principal-agent relationships. Moshe Halbertal discusses theories of sacrifice and why sacrifice has been an important cultural practice. Bengt Holmstrom studies principal-agent relationships when the agent's actions are not observable to the principal. The writings of Isocrates, an ancient Greek rhetorician, on education, philosophy, and politics. Farid Karkabi provides an introduction to Islamic finance. John Kelly proposes a formula for optimizing the growth rate of accumulated wealth through repeated bets or investments. Michel Lamont's work examines sociological and moral boundaries between groups. Isif Lazaridis et al. uses genetic data to study the origins of the Minoan and Mycenaean peoples of the Bronze Age Aegean. Edward Thorpe et al. applies Kelly's betting criterion to investing in securities. Benoit Mandelbrot proposes fractal geometry as a model for many phenomena in nature, finance, and other fields. 
Mandelbrot and Taleb argue that price changes in financial markets follow fractal dynamics with jumps, not a random walk. Avishai Margalit discusses theories of collective memory and the ethics of remembering and forgetting traumatic historical events. Thomas Nagel proposes a theory of how altruism and moral motivation are possible. Martin Novak et al. propose a theoretical model for the evolution of eusociality and cooperation. Eleanor Ostrom studies the governance of common pool resources from a polycentric, institutional perspective. Derek Parfit's theory of morality focuses on what matters in survival and ethics. Periander, the 7th century BCE ruler of Corinth, provides moral advice and maxims on good governance. Ol Peters and Murray Gell-Mann propose a method for modeling decisions under uncertainty based on assessing future histories. Peters studies how the infinite time horizon of the St. Petersburg paradox can be resolved by considering the finite resolution of measurements. Thomas Piketty studies social mobility and the persistence of inequality across generations. He also proposes a theory of inequality, growth, and wage gains. Steven Pinker argues that violence has declined over long-run historical timescales. E.J.G. Pittman studies sub-exponential and self-decomposable probability distributions. J.W. Pittman develops stochastic process models related to Brownian motion. J. Pratt et al. study agency theory and principal agent problems in economics. H. A. Pritchard discusses moral philosophy and the relationship between duty and knowledge. Mark Rank et al. study intergenerational income mobility and the likelihood of experiencing poverty during one's lifetime. Reed and Taleb proposes a theory of how religious beliefs and rituals can serve as a mechanism for managing tail risk across generations. Nicholas Rescher discusses theories of ignorance, opportunity loss, choice under uncertainty, and rational decision-making with limited knowledge. W. D. Ross proposes a theory of prima facie duty based on moral intuitionism. Stephen Ross proposes a model of principal-agent relationships where the agent has private information unknown to the principal. Alex Rutherford et al argues that physical barriers and boundaries can promote peace between groups under certain conditions. Constantine Sandys proposes a theory of practical reasoning and moral choice based on character, competence, and consequence. Sandys and Taleb propose that decision-makers should have skinned in the game to manage risk and asymmetry properly. Joseph Stiglitz studies principal-agent problems when the agent has private information unknown to the principal. Nassim Taleb proposes statistical and probability theory for phenomena dominated by extreme outliers, uncertainty, and opacity. Taleb and Cirilla study the shadow moments and alternative quantile estimators for infinitely mean phenomena. Taleb and Duwadi study the superadditivity of quantile and value at risk contributions for fat tailed risks. Taleb and Sandys propose the skin in the game heuristic for managing tail risk. J.L. Tugel surveys sub exponential probability distributions and their properties. D.F. Thompson discusses moral responsibility and principal-agent relationships and conditions under which advisors share responsibility with decision-makers. Jean Durrell studies oligopoly, industrial organization, and game theory. Islam Ward provides an introduction to Islamic economics and finance. Robert Wilkin discusses Christian minorities living within the Roman Empire. Bernard Williams discusses moral philosophy and ethics. David Sloan Wilson and Edward L. Wilson proposed a group selection theory in evolution. Michael Zimmerman discusses moral epistemology and making choices under uncertainty or ignorance. In summary, this set of sources covers probability theory, statistics, decision theory, ethics, philosophy, sociology, history, finance, and political science. There are many discussions of principal agent theory, extreme risks, radical uncertainty, religion, and inequality. The sources take various approaches, but many propose novel theories or models in their respective disciplines. Here is a summary. Extreme events and black swans are impossible to estimate scientifically. This makes some areas unpredictable and unforecastable. Conventional confirmatory methods of acquiring knowledge do not work for these types of events. Due to blindness to black swans, self-proclaimed experts make us prone to building increasingly fragile systems. Some benefit from disorder, volatility, time, chaos, variability, and stressors. Nassim Taleb calls these things anti-fragile. Other things are fragile in the face of these forces. We can classify things as fragile, robust, or anti-fragile based on how they respond non-linearly to disorder without knowing much about the history. This helps solve many of the problems created by black swans. You can only be alive if you appreciate, some, volatility and chaos. Overly fragile things die out, while anti-fragile things evolve and grow stronger. 
Nassim Taleb spent 21 years taking risks before becoming a researcher focused on probability and its philosophical, mathematical, and practical applications.